again to our Sunday evening teaching service in which we go into the Word of God. As we always say, our Sunday evening service is pure teaching and ministry of the Word of God. Over the last 12 weeks, this is the 13th week, we have been looking at the book of Ephesians. And I will not spend too much time going over what we've already said. The messages are available on a DVD format. You can get them by either going to my website. You see the address of the website coming on your screen now. Or you can go to YouTube and see them. So I'd like to welcome every one of you that are on the internet, that are here, that may be watching the recording of this. I greet you in the wonderful name of Jesus. And we are going to continue our study of Ephesians. Now some of you that are watching this on the internet will be wondering, why didn't you send me any notes this week? Well, the reason I didn't send you any notes this week is because we are looking at chapter 5 and it's very easy to understand. There is not a lot of explanation that is needed. When we looked at chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, we were looking at some quite complicated doctrinal issues. We looked at uh, election, predestination, we looked at the state of man, we remember that we discussed how that God chose us in him from before the foundation of the world, that God had elected the people unto salvation. We were uh, told, how, we were showed how that the condition of men, that man was dead in trespass and sin, he was under the wrath of God, he was on his way to a lost eternity, we showed the way of salvation. And last week we started to take a look at chapter 5. And we briefly went into the, the, the security of the believer. Now I know that doctrine is very controversial. I don't know why it's controversial. Because you would think that people would like to be secure in their salvation. Because you've either got eternal security or you've got eternal insecurity. But we believe in this ministry that a person that is truly saved will remain saved. So we're going to take a look at chapter 5. Remember what we've just said. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3 deals with the doctrinal issues concerning the, the, our salvation, the condition of man. And chapter 4 talks about the unity of the faith. It talks about the purpose of the fivefold ministry that God has placed in the church. And the true church of God today has still got a fivefold ministry. I believe, and my belief is based on scripture. I believe, based on the word of God that all the ministry gifts are in the church today and that all the gifts of the Spirit are in the church today. Not one has ceased. We've still got apostles, we've still got prophets, we've still got, we still have tongues, interpretation of tongues and prophecy 
not one has ceased. Now I know some people just love to say, well, I've been in the churches and I've seen those gifts abused. Well, I've seen pastors abuse their position. But that doesn't mean we don't have pastors today. We've still got pastors. Now, of course, there is a counterfeit ministry. There are counterfeit pound notes. There are counterfeit dollars. But that doesn't mean there are no genuine ones. And the true church, in the true church today, there are genuine apostles, there are genuine prophets, and there are genuine gifts of the Spirit. And chapter 4 talks about the purpose of the fivefold ministry. But in chapter 5, we talk, it talks about the walk of the believer. It shows what a true Christian should be doing. You see, we are not saved to carry on sinning. We are not saved to carry on living the way that we used to live before we were saved. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things become new. As Christians, believers in Christ, we are expected to walk, to talk, to act and live like we belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We show our relationship to the Holy God by living a holy life. Now, as I said, we don't do those things to earn our salvation. I'm not talking about earning your salvation. I'm talking about because we are saved, we will do these things. We don't do them to be saved. We do them because we are saved. We don't live holy to be saved. In fact, you cannot live holy. You cannot live until you are saved. We were dead in trespasses and sins. He has brought us alive, he has saved us, we are redeemed. We are translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We are now the children of the living God. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We have the life of Christ and we have been resurrected. It's the same, the Bible says, if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in us, he will quicken our mortal bodies. We are alive and we are the saved as we will ever be. I heard the man the other day saying, well, we're not saved yet. We're not saved until we get to heaven. That's not true. The Bible says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We have everlasting life. We have passed from death unto life. We are saved. We have the life of God in us. These things... John said, these things I write unto you that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that you may know that you have everlasting life. We are not going to be saved. We are saved. We are saved. We are saved from sin. We are saved from the penalty of sin. And there's going to come a day in the future where we'll be saved from the very presence of sin. And though we are saved from sin now, and, but we are not saved from the presence. We are saved from the power of sin. We are saved from sin. But we are not saved from the presence of sin because there is sin all around us. But there is going to come a day when Jesus Christ returns where the righteousness of God will cover the earth even as the waters cover the sea. And there will be no more sin. There will be no more death. There will be no more iniquity. We will not have to separate ourselves from unrighteousness because there will be no unrighteousness. But we live in a world of sin, we live in darkness, and because we live in a dark world, you and I that have the light are expected to be the light of the world. So we are expected to be the light of the world. So we're going to, we're going to take a look now at chapter 5, and I'm just going to read it and comment on it. This is not going to be as deep and as in-depth as some of the other subjects. This is basic Christian living. It's what you and I should be living, should be doing. And as we read the Word of God, we need to apply it to our life. And where the Bible says that something is wrong, we don't debate about it, we don't argue about it, we don't justify it. If the Bible says it's wrong, then it's wrong and we stop doing it. 
And if the Bible says what we should be doing, we don't debate, we don't try to find loopholes, we just do it. Too many Christians try to find loopholes around it. But let's take a look. And I'm going to read chapter 1, chapter 5, and verse 1. Chapter 5 and verse 1. It says, Be ye followers of God as dear children. Now we live in a world that is full of sin and full of iniquity, where many, many people are following their pop stars, they are following their idols, but we are to be followers of God. Now you say, well, wait a minute, how can I follow God? God's in heaven. God is omnipotent, omnipresent. How can I follow God? Well, when it says follow God, it means be obedient unto God. We follow God by being obedient. We follow a holy God by living a holy life. If Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So what does that mean? If, some, if, if the Bible says love me, keep my commandments, what does, it, what, is, what does it tell you about somebody who doesn't keep their commandments? If we love him, we will keep his commandments. So if we're not keeping his commandments, what does that tell us? Anybody? But well, we don't love him, do we? We're not obedient. If you love me, you will do it. Now it says, look, and walk in love. As Christ have loved us and have given himself for us and offering a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling saviour walk in love does not mean that we have to accept everything that is but even when we rebuke somebody and even when we make a stand we do it in love but loving God first not loving man first if you love man first you are compromised if you love man higher than God you will compromise but we see do I approve of certain things no let me give you one I don't approve of homosexuality, but if I but to, but if I tell a homosexual that lifestyle is okay, that's not showing love. Knowing that they're going to go to hell, knowing that their lifestyle is an abomination unto God, but in love, I tell not in hatred, not in bitterness, not with some kind of homophobia, but we tell them the truth that that lifestyle is an abomination unto God. We love them enough to speak the truth because we want to see them saved. And when you stand for holiness, you must do it, not in bitterness, not in resentment, but out of love. And love does not compromise the word of God. Love does not say something is, something is right when it is wrong. If you love your children, you will correct their bad behaviour. If God, when God loves us, he chastises us, those that he loveth. He chastiseth. This is not this kind of sloppy, kind of hippie, kind of love where we love everybody, man. We just love everybody. Never tell anybody they're wrong because you may upset them. Well, the greatest example of love was Jesus. Nobody would show more love than Jesus. And he is our example of what true love should be. And when Jesus went into the temple and he saw the money changers, the man that loved his father so much couldn't bear to see the money <laughs> changers, the way they were abusing the <coughs> temple. And they cast it and he turned over the tables. He was the Jesus that, the love, that re it really was, had true love. But he turned to the Pharisees and called them a bunch of hypocrites, a bunch of white tits of pokers. He said, you're like the tombs of the prophets, bright and shiny on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. Now some people don't think that's love. Well, that is love. That's true love. That is true love. Because love does not compromise. And we hold the truth in love. So it says, and walk in love as Christ have loved us and have given himself for us as an offering, a sacrifice, a sweet smelling saviour. But fornication and cleanness, of the richness, let it not be named 
among you as becometh saints. Now it doesn't mean you can't mention the word fornication. What it means is you should not be identified as a fornicator. It should never be said that you're a fornicator. It should never be said that you're an adulterer. It should, when it says not named among us, it means that nobody, in a, nobody should be identified as such. You say, well, that seems obvious to me. Why did Paul write it? Well, it might seem obvious to you and I in the 21st century, but these, but the Ephesians came, came from a place called Ephesus that was given to all kind of idolatry and pagan worship. It was where the great, great Diana had her temple and part of their culture in those pagan worshippers was that when they went to worship God, part of their worship was to have intercourse with one of these temple prostitutes that had laid down, that they gave their body. So, to, to the Ephesians, adultery and fornication was seen as it was the everyday thing for anybody worshipping God. Because that was part of their worship. That was normal worship to them. But Paul was saying, no, we don't do those things. That's not Christian. That's not the Christian faith. That's what you came out of. It's about fornication, and uncleanness, and covetousness. Let, let it not be named among you as become a saint. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving thanks. In other words, as Christians, we are expected to live our life 24 hours a day in a way that brings honour and glory to God. So we don't do anything in our life that is not considered holy or righteous. That's why Paul, Paul said no foolish jesting, no idle conversations. He didn't say we couldn't have a joke. You know, some people take that verse and go to an extreme and say you mustn't laugh. Must have never laughed. No, Paul was not saying that. He was talking about he was talking about people that go overboard on certain things. And then in verse five he says, For for this you know that no whoremong no whoremonger, that's a man that goes with prostitutes, nor unclean person, nor idolater, have any inheritance in the kingdom of of God. So don't tell me that you're saved if you're doing those things. Because if you're, if you're doing those things, you're not saved. Some people say, well, they've lost their salvation. They didn't lose it. They were never saved to begin with. Those that do those things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So though we believe in eternal security, we do not believe that you can live any way you like and still and be a Christian. But if you are a Christian, you will not be living the way you like. You'll be living the way God wants you to live. Because your whole life is to the honour and glory of Almighty God. These are the marks of a Christian. We are saved to worship Him. That's one of the reasons why I believe in Lordship salvation. Because obedience is not an option. You know what Jesus said to some people? Why you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? If he's our master, we would obey him. We are saved to obey. Paul called himself a bond slave. We are servants of the Most High God. You know what that means? Slaves. We are slaves to God. He is our master. He is our ruler. I know some people hate the doctrine of Lordship salvation. Because they're antinomian, they're, law, they're lawlessness. They don't want to submit to God. Well, submission is not an option. Because when, when you became a Christian, what did you do? You called upon the name of the Lord, your master. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, that means... Someone said, does that mean that we make him Lord of our life? No, you don't make him Lord, he is Lord. You, do, you can't make God anything. You can't make Jesus anything. Jesus is what he is, but when he saves you, 
He makes himself Lord of your life. He makes himself Master of your life. Let no man deceive you with vain words. Verse 6. For because of these things come the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. There shall be, near, be not ye therefore partakers with them. Notice the wrath of God is coming upon them. So don't be partakers with them. If the wrath of God is going to come upon people, you shouldn't be joining with them. You say, well, does, does that mean I've got to shut myself away? No. Jesus ate and drank with sinners. But we must not be partakers of their deeds. We must let our light so shine. We've got to mix with them. We've got to talk to them. We've got to share the gospel with them. We can eat with them. We can... Like Jesus did. He ate and drank with sinners. But he didn't become a sinner. You don't, you don't win a prostitute... By becoming a prostitute. You don't win a drug addict by becoming a drug addict. You won't win an alcoholic by going out and getting a bottle of rum and getting drunk. But you mix with them. You share the gospel with them. But remember, you are there to represent the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And when you're with them, you are still an ambassador of Christ. You are still a child of the living God and you are there to represent the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So we don't partake of them. We don't partake of their deeds. But we still witness to them. We're not, we're not to shut ourselves in some monastery and keep ourselves away. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. And while we're in the world, we are to be a light unto the world and we must show by the life that we live <coughs> that the message that we preach is true because people don't only hear the message but they see the message being lived in our lives. So it says in verse 8 But ye were sometimes in darkness. And we were, we were in darkness. You were sometimes in darkness but now ye light but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Walk as children of light. In the, in the midst of darkness. What does that mean, darkness and light? What does it mean? Well, it means in the world system and in the ways of the world, they practice ethics that are contrary to the will of God. Some people practice situation ethics. In other words, it, when in Rome... Do as the Romans do. That's situation ethics. It's okay to tell a, it's okay to live a dirty life if you live with dirty people. That's situation ethics. If you're in church, you talk oh, you you speak right because that, that's a situation. In other words, in Rome, do as the Romans do. Well, that might be a, a, that is a saying of the well, but that is not that but that kind of ethics goes contrary to the will of God because no matter what situation we are in, no matter what culture we are among, no matter what people we are, we are to let our light so shine, we are consistent. We are not one thing in church on Sunday and another thing at work on Monday. We are a child of God 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 12 months of the year for the rest of our life. Our, we remain steadfast grounded in the word of God and whether we are mixing or talking to the drug addicts, the alcoholics, whether we're at work and we see people um, stealing from their workplace, we remain steadfast because we are there to represent the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. We are a Christian 24 hours a day and we don't change to fit into the situation, every situation Whatever the situation is, we must remain the same because God is the same wherever we may be, and we know that God is everywhere. But God doesn't. But God is holy everywhere He is, even when even though God can be in the midst of a place that is not holy. David said, "If I if I make my bed in hell, 
be old thou art there. If I ascend into heaven, be old thou art there. But the God that is, but the, the omnipotent God, the, the omnipresent God that is in heaven and hell is holy in hell and is holy in heaven because God does not change. In Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord, I change not. And God remains the same in every situation. And we, as the children of God, must remain steadfast and true in every situation because we serve a God that is holy all the time. Therefore, as children of God, we should aim to be holy every time. And I, am I saying that we never sin? I'm not saying that we never sin, but we don't excuse our sin. When we sin, we repent of it. We turn to the Lord. Let me let me move on again. Let me move on again. Verse nine. But the fruit of the spirit. This is what the fruit of the spirit. This is not option. Bringing forth fruit in a Christian life is not an option. But this is the kind of fruit that will tell you whether you are a believer or a make believer. This will tell you whether that Christian is a real Christian. Or a make or a make believing Christian. What are the fruits of the Spirit? But the fruit of the Spirit is in all godliness and righteousness in truth. And what is truth? What is truth? Truth is in Jesus. Jesus, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. Truth is found in the written word of God, and it is also, and it is found in the word that was made flesh, and that is Jesus Christ himself. Proving what is acceptable unto God. Proving what is acceptable unto God. And let me read that from another translation. I'll read that from the Amplified Version, uh, verse, um, verse 10. And it says, and try to learn in your experience what is pleasing to the Lord. Let your life be constant. Prove of what is most acceptable to him. In other words, we do that which is pleasing in God's sight. That's simply, simply, simply put. And have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Now I had someone say, I can fellowship with everybody. Well, I can't fellowship with everybody. I can talk to anybody, but I can't fellowship with everybody. But we are to reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Verse 13, but all things which are reproved are made manifest by the light. And whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Let me put it this way, a simple way to understand it. If you're not sure if something is wrong, then can you do it openly? Someone says, well, it's okay to steal some pens at work, is it? Well, if it's okay, why, do you, why don't you do it when the, when the manager's there? If it's acceptable and okay, why don't you just say when the manager's there? Go out, go out up in the cupboard, I say, okay, I'm just stocking up at home. You know it's wrong because you have to wait for the manager to leave before you do it. The question is, can you do it? And another question is, could I do it if my pastor is there? Could I do it if there was other true Christians around? Could I do it? If, you're ca if you can't do it or you have to hide it from other Christians, then you know it's wrong. That's why you're hiding it. That's why you're keeping it secret. For all things which are reproved are made manifest by the light. And whatsoever doth make it manifest in, in light. I, I had someone say to me one time, well, it's okay for me to it's okay for me to go out and commit adultery once in a while. I'm in the flesh. I said, is it okay? Well, don't tell me it's okay. Get down on your hands and knees and just tell God it's okay. Don't tell me. Of course they couldn't do it because they know it's wrong. And what they try to do is justify their sins. And verse 14 it says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, 
and arise from the dead. And Christ give light, give me light. In other words, uh, I read that ver I read that one from the Amplified Bible, where verse um, fourteen. Therefore, he says, "Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ shall shine, make day dawn upon you, and give you light." In other words. Don't live like you're still in sin. Get up and live and let your light so shine be for men. And then it says, See ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. I'll read that from the Amplified Bible also. It says, uh, Look carefully how you walk. Live purposely and work inaccurately. Not as unwise or unlearned, but as wise, sensible, intelligent people. In other words, just show that we are wise in God's sight by the way that we walk, the way that we live. He's just talking about living the life. And it says, Be not drunk with wine, whereupon is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Doesn't need no explanation, does it? What about this one? Fill in your mind with the word of God. It says, speak into yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Just train yourself as you go around to think about being, worshipping God, be in an attitude of prayer, uh, singing hymns. Make sure that you, I, I always find it helpful at, at times just to play some gospel music because it helps and Surround yourself with people that love the Lord and fill your mind with the Word of God, giving thanks always for all things unto God. I'm sure that you can find, all, I'm sure that Christians should be able to find things to thank God for. It's amazing how many Christians can find something to moan about. There's a lot that we can be thankful for. Thank God for your husband. Thank God for your wife. Thank God that you've got a job. If you haven't got a job, at least thank God that you've got food to eat. You've got a roof over your head. You've got clothes to wear. Look around right now and you find something to give thanks to God for. And then it talks about submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. People hate the word submission, but submission is a blessing. Christians that will not submit to anybody don't know are missing a great blessing. We are to submit. And it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands, as unto the Lord. That is a verse that doesn't go down well today in that equality and fem feminist world that we live in. But we have to understand that submitting to your husband doesn't mean living like a slave. It doesn't mean being in bondage. It means freedom. Look what it says. It says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your husband as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their husbands in everything. Now, what does that mean? Well, first of all, it's not the way that many people take it. There's a lot of married men that love that verse, wives submit yourself to your husbands. But he says, as unto the Lord. It talks about, therefore, as Christ is the subject to the... Let me read that again. Therefore, as the, as the church is subject unto Christ, so that the wives be to their husbands in everything. So we have to understand what did Jesus do for the church? Because this is the husband's responsibility. If the husband was to behave like Jesus, there wouldn't be no problem in submitting. So even though the church is submissive to Christ, take a look at what Christ did. Jesus laid down his life. He died on the cross for his church. When we see Jesus, who is the head, he gets down and he washes the saints' feet. He fed them when there, when there was little food. He multiplied the loaves and fishes. When they were sick, he healed them. 
Jesus, who is the head, said the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life. If the man is the head, as Christ is the head, then the man will give his life in service to his wife, as Jesus gave his life in service to the church. This is not ill-treating. Jesus, Jesus never said to anybody, go and do that and give them a smack around the ear. Jesus never abused the church. He cared and he loved. Let me tell you, friends, it says the wife should submit to the husband as unto the Lord. If you as a husband are not submitted unto the Lord, then you've got no right to expect your wife to submit to you. If you are not acting as a biblical husband, then you've got no right to expect your wife to submit to you because your wife does not have to take abuse because Jesus never abused the church. And he says, husband, loves your wife, love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water with this word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot nor wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. So that is our aim in our walk for Christian life. We should aim for perfection. Am I saying that we are perfect yet? Am I saying that we are sinless yet? No, I'm not. But that should be our aim. We should be pursuing holiness. We should, at the end of each day, think to ourselves, how much more can I do? I love the Lord so much, I want to give him my everything. I want the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart to be acceptable in his sight. I don't want to, I don't want people to say at me, hey, he preaches one thing, but look how he lives. We need to cleanse ourselves. You say, well, I thought Jesus cleansed us. That's right, the blood of Jesus Christ does cleanse us from sin. But the Bible also says that we must cleanse ourselves smaller than the filthiness of the flesh. The blood of Jesus will cleanse your sin. But the blood of Jesus will not empty your drawers of dirty magazines, etc. There are some things that you're going to have to do. There are some things that you're going to have to get rid of in your life that are contrary to the will of God. And it could be things that are quite close to you. It could be a friend that's been close to you, but if they're in to get rid of them. Jesus said, if thy right hand offend thee, that's my left hand, if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. In other words, he's not talking about literally cutting off your arms and legs, but it means something that is so close to you. It could be a friend, it could be a loved one, it could be anybody. But we need to separate ourselves from anything that is going to hinder us in our walk with God. Let me read that so men ought to love their own wives. Verse, verse 28, so ought men to love their own wives as their, as their own bodies. And he that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, even as the Lord, Lord the church. That's how we are to behave towards each other, when we see someone hurting, we don't get our, we don't start moaning and complaining, we treat them, we treat our wives like ourselves. I remember once I was going to, I was banging a nail in, and I missed the nail and caught my thumb. Now I didn't get hold of my thumb and start screaming at it and saying you, too, you this and you that, you this and you that, you this and you that. I didn't give it a long lecture on why it shouldn't be there. You know what I did? I got hold of it and went, ooh! And the rest of my body took care. And that is the way that we are to treat our wives. That's the way that we are to treat our husbands. That's the way we are to treat each other. For no man, verse 20, ever hates of his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, 
of his bones. From this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they two shall become one. When you upset your wife, you upset yourself. When you upset your husband, you upset yourself. Are, are you saying there shouldn't be no disagreements in marriage? Well, I've been married 31 years, and yes, there are going to be disagreements. There's going to be upsets. There's going to be things. This is natural part of married life. But one of the things I've learned, when I've upset my wife, I've never been happy. I've always been upset myself. And I'm sure that it is probably true for my wife as well. But I'll let her speak for herself. Okay, for this call shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. One of the things I find that marriages where the wife keeps running back to the mother every problem or the man keeps running down to mummy every problem, those marriages never last. We are to leave our father and mother. That doesn't, that doesn't mean we don't talk to them again. It means that we now we don't run to mum and dad at every problem. We sort out our own problems. We no longer answer them. When we were a child, some would run to mum. And now we don't run to mum. When I've got a problem, I don't run to mum. I run to my wife. When my wife's got a problem, we run to we, she runs to me. And you know what we do? We put it in the hands of God. We don't run home to mummy. That is immature. When I hear people, when I hear married couples say, oh, I'm leaving you and going back to mum, I think to myself, grow up! Have you not read that verse? For this call shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined unto his wife. Your mother and father had a great responsibility in bringing you up. They deserve some peace in their life. Sort out your problem between the two of you. Verse 32, for this, nevertheless, let every one of you, in particular, so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife, see that she reverence her husband. One of the things is, over the years, is a successful marriage leads to a successful ministry. That is why writing to Timothy and talking about uh, the requirements or the prerequisites for ministry, Paul says a bishop must be the husband of one wife, a deacon must be the husband of one wife and must rule their house well. There must be, because if your marriage is falling apart, it's going to affect the ministry. So every, every, every marriage that is successful is a kind of church. And we should aim for success in marriage. But then let's take a look at chapter 5. And basically, when we read the whole of chapter 5, from verse 1 to verse 38, the whole chapter can be summed up very simply. Live like a Christian. Live the life. Don't just preach, but live it. Don't just talk about being a Christian. Live like a Christian. Don't just talk about holiness. Live holiness. And... I would say to you, surround yourself with people that mean Jesus. Stay away from those Christians that are always telling you, well that's okay, God don't mind you doing this, God don't mind you doing that. You can still do this and be a Christian, you can still do that, a Christ be a, that, that, that and be a Christian. But get among people that say, I don't want to see how close to the world I can get and still be a Christian. I want to get as far away from sin as possible. I want to embrace the things of God. I want to love the things that God loves. I want to walk in obedience to the will of God. Not because you're trying to earn your salvation. 
but because you love God so much. And you know that God, when God tells you to do something, it's because he knows what is best for you. That's right. God, the God that created man, knows what is best for man. And God isn't telling us not to do something because he wants us to be miserable. But I tell you, the God that created man and woman out of the dust of the earth, he knows what is best for man. He knows more what, what is beneficial to man more than all the psychologists in the world, more than all the doctors in the world, more than all the psychiatrists in the world. He created man and he knows what is best for man. And when he talks about fleeing fornication, when he talks about not committing adultery, when he talks about these things, he knows what is benefit for man. And God doesn't always explain why. Have you ever noticed that God never gives a reason? He just tells us not to do anything. When God gave the Ten Commandments, he said, Thou shalt not. He didn't say, Thou shalt not, because. He never gave a reason. He just says, Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. In the New Testament, we read about things that we should do. He doesn't always say why. But we must trust God, that God is, God is a God of love, that God loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son, came into this world and he got done to die for us on that old rugged cross. That's how much he loved us. And when God tells us something is right for us or something is wrong for us, it's because he knows what is beneficial to us. And if we will trust and obey, we will know the reason why. And I'll tell you one thing, if we trust and obey, if, if men and women was to walk in obedience to the will of God, there would be no unwanted children in the world. There would be no abortions. There would be no abused children. There would be no divorce. There would be no rape. There would be no murder. There would be no stealing. Our police force would be redundant. If everybody in the world would walk in obedience to this book. Because it is for our benefit. It is for our benefit. Well... As I said, I didn't give no notes because chapter 5 is so easy to understand. It's easy to understand, it's sometimes it's more difficult to do it than it is to understand it. And next week we're going to take a look at chapter 6. We've come to the end of the teaching this week. And I hope that this week, taking in everything that we've said over the weeks, and bringing it into the practical part of Christianity, I pray that I have motivated you to holiness and to righteousness and to clean living. So until we meet again, this is David McKibbit saying unto you that no matter what the problem may be, Jesus is the answer. Thank you for listening to Evangelist David McKivitt. If you need prayer or would like to receive a free copy of our magazine called The Great Commission, write to Full Gospel Evangelism, PO Box 24528, London, E17 3FG. That is Full Gospel Evangelism, PO Box 24528, London, E17 3FG. Eternal life is a free gift from God. Jesus died for you at Calvary. He is the way, the truth, the life, the door. If you believe in Him, you shall be saved. Cause God's free gift to you is eternal life. 
Jesus Christ.